So I thought it was a great keynote, and we've got a third panel on the topic of energy policy. We've got a very French-heavy policy perspective in here, but we have a book ended with Varun Rai and Roger Duncan to give some American perspective as well. Uh, Richard Newell from Duke University got the flu and couldn't join us, but we uh, got to upgrade, I guess, to Roger Duncan to go to one of our local uh, policy experts and heroes, so he'll be able to make some comments uh, on this topic. And I'd like to introduce Dr. Varun Rai, an assistant professor in the OBJ School, who also is affiliated with mechanical engineering at UT. So he's an engineer who thinks about policy, doing a lot of innovative research at the OBJ School, and has really sort of established an international reputation for himself. He'll be moderating this panel. Uh, Varun. Thank you for the introduction, Michael. Good afternoon, everyone. Is everyone awake? Hello? Yeah. <laughs> Let's wake up. Uh, we have had two very superb panels in the morning. One was on shale gas and then on the power sector. And just now we heard from Scott Tinker, it was a terrific, with a K, uh, keynote lecture. So uh, the panelists here, have we have a, a challenging task to keep up to that tempo, and I am very confident that we'll be able to do that. The theme of this panel is energy policy. You have heard uh, in the morning and also during the keynote that the world is going through a massive uh, transformation, the world, especially the energy system in the, in the world thanks to development of new energy sources, but also the arrival of game-changing technologies like shale gas, but also uh, in smart grids. Increasingly, we are seeing newer technologies uh, coming into the market. And all of that are having transformative uh, impacts. At the same time, you're also seeing new, as well as old, environmental challenges emerging, and also uh, issues of cybersecurity associated with uh, smart grids. So, so promises on one side, but also new uh, challenges. What we want to do in this panel is to discuss how, what the right policy framework is to manage that transition. We heard Ernie Moniz and also some other panelists talk to us uh, and mention that these challenges can be managed, but will we really manage them? Uh, that's what we want to uh, discuss and how to go about that. Uh, clearly, the private sector is going to lead the way in that, but we also want to make sure that uh, government is doing its job and want to discuss really what the role of government is in making policy. Uh, so that we achieve this transformation in socially optimal ways. So what I'll do is introduce our panelists very briefly, and then ask them to make uh, their own comments in uh, ten, about 10 minutes each. Uh, we'll have a discussion among the panelists and myself for about 10, 15 minutes, and then finally we'll open up uh, to the floor for, for the questions. Uh, I'll introduce my, our, uh, the panelists uh, from left to right here. Uh, first up, uh, Pierre Gauthier. Pierre is the president and CEO of Halston US. He has held a number of leadership positions in the industry uh, for over 30 years. In his current position, he directs Alstom's effort to address the country's energy and rail transformation uh, challenges. Next, we have Patrice Dufran. He is a professor of economics at the Paris Dauphine University. He's also the director of the Research Center in Energy Economics and president of the Advisory Council of the Climate Economics uh, Chair. Next, we have Dr. Paul Lucas, who is the advisor to the general director of new technologies for energy at CEA in France. He has over 25 years of experience in, in the energy industry and research. Among others, he has worked on nuclear, hydrogen, and fuel cell technologies. Next, we have Dr. Francois Moussa, who is the director for R&D at the French Environment and Energy Management Agency. Currently, he's also chairman of the Energy Efficiency Committee of World Energy Council. And finally, we have Mr. Roger Duncan, who is a research fellow at the Center for International Energy and Environmental Policy here at UT. Formerly, he was the general manager of Austin Energy, the local electric utility uh, in the city of Austin. In that role, Roger started several initiatives that have uh, put Austin in leading position in the rapidly changing world of uh, electricity. So with that, let's welcome our panelists and move on with their comments. Thank you, Varun. Thank you, Dr. Weber, for uh, inviting me. Um, just one thing, though. Next time, uh, uh, let us uh, speak before uh, Mr. Tinker. He's a hard act to, to follow. Um, Alstom is a, there we go. Alstom is a leading uh, global provider of technology for power generation, transportation, and power transmission. We're probably better known for the high-speed rail for those who uh, have been to Europe. 
uh, our equipment uh, can be found in almost half of America's power plants, and we have over 100 years of U.S. experience. Energy is one of America's most fundamental policy, one that impacts the environment, national security, innovation, competitiveness, and job creation, much like you've seen this morning. The United States is blessed, unlike France, with abundant domestic energy resources. And maintaining diversity of supply has long been a guiding principle of U.S. energy policy. Different regions of the country have developed energy portfolios based on local opportunities. Hydroelectric power, for instance, is plentiful along the major rivers of the Pacific Northwest. Mines in West Virginia, Kentucky, Montana, and Wyoming made coal a dominant source of electricity across the country. Texas geography has made it the nation's leading producer of wind energy. We put in a plant in Amarillo, Texas. The reason being, and I, I saw this, is that uh, there's wind there all the time. Uh, over 10,000 megawatts in Texas uh, have been installed. The underlying benefit of this regional approach to electricity, whether you call it all of the above or simply use everything you have, is that it insulates consumers and businesses against spikes in the price of any one energy resources. I remind you that uh, a lot of people gambled on gas in the 1990s and suffered greatly about it. As the second Obama administration looks to shape the future of U.S. energy policy, it is encouraging to hear now, and as we heard in the, during the campaign, a consensus from both sides of the aisle around an all-of-the-above approach. The challenge U.S. policymakers face lies in defining what all-of-the-above actually means. Alstom approaches this issue as a techno technology company. Our job is to provide the power generation and grid technologies our customer needs when they need it. Those needs are driven by two major influencers, market dynamics and government policy. A clear and consistent long-term policy will provide our customers with framework upon which to approach changing market conditions. We define the policy as one that preserves diversity, in America's energy supply, strikes a smart balance in our use of fossil fuels, and draws more efficiency and output from our existing power infrastructure. While there is ge uh, a general agreement on the merits of diversity, access to low-cost domestic gas supplies is, of course, dominating the U.S. energy debate. We need to take advantage of the opportunity afforded by abundant natural gas and we need to seize its potential as an affordable source of electricity, a catalyst for domestic manufacturing and a creator of jobs for U.S. workers. However, energy should not be driven entirely by short-term price considerations. Investments in the power generation market is more a long-term aspect of investment. Also, if we truly want to reduce the long-term environmental impacts of power generation, we must also make smart decisions today that will lead to greater energy mix tomorrow. And uh, just a few words on offshore wind, uh, which is an area of tremendous potential, which we haven't heard too much this morning. And today, Alstom is part of a team developing a 1.4 gigawatt wind farm off the coast of France. That project has led to introduction of a new six megawatt wind turbine designed specifically for offshore use. Wind turbine machines have grown over the last 20 years a hundredfold, from a few kilowatts to now a few megawatts. Offshore wind is creating an entirely new industrial base in France. Another area, which is solar power, is another long-term opportunity. Alstom has established a partnership with Bright Source Energy focused on the development of concentrated solar power. 
Bright Source has passed the AF mark on construction of California's Evenpa solar electric generation station, the world's largest thermal project. And finally, a few words on diversity. Moving on, we find that abundant natural gas is also prompting a spirited debate uh, on the way America uses or balances its use of fossil fuels. The American Gas Association states there's about 100 years of natural gas reserves in, in North America, uh, but there's also 200 years of coal reserves. Coal will and should play a vital role in America's energy future. Together, coal and gas account for about half of America's electricity supply. Beyond the opportunities we see today, we must also begin preparing for a carbon-constrained future. We expect limits on CO2 emissions will eventually take effect. We anticipate a point at which these restrictions will require the deployment of carbon capture and storage on coal, but also on gas-fired power plants. But today, we lack the basic regulatory mechanisms that would drive investments in carbon-cutting technology. In fact, in the United States, the push to develop market-ready carbon capture and storage has all but stalled. At sites here in the U.S. and around the world, Alstom has proven that CCS works and we can achieve plus 90% capture of CO2. Another aspect which was mentioned a lot this morning is efficiency. It is the final element to consider in the context of our energy strategy. In addition, to developing new sources of electricity, we should take a hard look at unlocking potential in assets and infrastructure we already have. In most nuclear power plants we work in, we can improve by 60 megawatts the existing uh, productivity of that plant. Uh, since 1990, uh, what has been done would have equaled several nu new nuclear reactors. America's energy policy should focus not only on producing electricity, but also on meeting the needs of a changing energy mix and ensure more and more power reaches the end users. High voltage DC linkages, for example, can be used to provide single points of connection for multiple offshore wind farms, while also streamlining the integration of renewable energy onto the existing grid. Technologies like AC transmission systems can make the grid more efficient, improve power quality, and reduce line loss. Demand response technology can offset the need for costly new transmission and generation projects. Finally, as we all saw during Hurricane Sandy, there is a clear need to make America's grid more resilient. Standalone microgrids should be considered as a way to keep communities powered during large-scale power outages. And next, distribution, next generation distribution management offer communities a way to partially automate the restoration process and rapidly turn the lights back on. In conclusion, it used to be said that Washington would pass an energy policy every 10 years, whether it needed it or not. Well, we're 10 years overdue already. As I consider the needs and challenges of customers, our leaders would do well to shape that policy around a diverse energy mix, a balanced approach to fossil fuels, and making our existing energy assets work harder and more efficiently. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you, Michael. Uh, merci beaucoup for your kind uh, uh, invitation and for the wonderful uh, efficiency of all your team. Uh, well, I, as a French guy, maybe it's more simple to address uh, um, European energy issue than French energy issue because uh, uh, in that case, you are obliged to, to anticipate what might be the future of nuclear energy or fracking in France and 
and it is uh, maybe too complex. Uh, more seriously, uh, my view is that to understand what might happen in the future in France, we need, uh, we need to have an idea of uh, what is today and for the future the European perspective. And I will try to balance on one side the ambition at the European level, and some of them have been uh, defined this morning by uh, Franck Carré, and also the, the difficulty, and, and you will see that uh, uh, many issues will have to be solved. Uh, first of all, we know that in 2020, the aim of the European Union is to decrease by 20% the, uh, the CO2 emission, but in uh, 2050, uh, uh, and this is the next uh, frontier, uh, we will have to decrease that level of CO2 emission by 80%, meaning that uh, uh, we will have to divide by uh, two more or less uh, the consumption of uh, energy in, in Europe. For that, some uh, diverse strategy might be implemented at the European level, but uh, uh, moreover at the level of the member state, because uh, you, you need to keep in mind that since the very beginning of the European uh, project, uh, 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 close to uh, 60 years ago, the definition of the energy policy is mainly based on, uh, at, uh, uh, in mainly related to the national level. But we have, we have a common ambition, and that ambition might be uh, satisfied through different routes, uh, gaining in uh, energy efficiency, uh, uh, improving the level and developing uh, uh, renewable energy sources, or with a combination of that uh, uh, diverse dimension. In any case, and you can see it in comparing what might be the situation in 2030 and in 2050, uh, it may lead to very different energy mixes uh, in Europe. Uh, just consider, for example, uh, the uh, renewable energy uh, sources uh, in 2050 that may represent between, uh, let's say, uh, 35 and 60% uh, and, uh, of uh, uh, the, the energy mix at uh, that, that time. But what we know, as far we, as we know anything today, uh, uh, 40 years before uh, that, uh, uh, the end of that uh, ambition, it will lead to uh, higher usage of uh, electricity in the mixes, and especially with uh, uh, an increase of uh, decarbonized uh, transport. But this was just to introduce what will be the center of my uh, speech, uh, meaning to stress the various issues related to the management of that uh, transition. Uh, first of all, and this is also unfortunately something that we have in common between France, Europe, and, and US, uh, there will be growing constraint on uh, uh, public budget uh, related to the management of the public debt. Uh, you have here a comparison between uh, uh, the 70s, uh, uh, the 80s, and, and so and so, and you see uh, quite mechanically a growing level of the public debt, uh, meaning that uh, the constraint will be uh, higher than anticipated a few years ago as to sustain the development of new uh, models related to renewable, uh, related to energy efficiency. Uh, meaning that we will have both to be very innovative in the, in the technical field, but also that we will need uh, to invent a new economic model and new financial model, and we have that constraint in, in common. Second issue, we will need uh, to uh, manage growing level of intermittency. Uh, we are able to do that uh, uh, between uh, wind power and gas, but it is more and more complex in Europe because, to be clear, we, have, uh, we don't have any more business model for the development of new uh, gas uh, power plant, very roughly. Uh, it is a kind of side effect of uh, fracking in the US because uh, the very impressive result of fracking in US leads to more uh, trade of coal between 
US and Europe, and today considering also the low level of uh, CO2 price in, in Europe, it is more uh, efficient from an economic point of view to uh, use uh, coal to produce electricity than, uh, than gas. And then, then um, since we will need gas in the future and also nuclear power in the future, well, we, we will uh, need to invent models as to combine the development of wind power and solar power on, on one side and, and to keep more flexible means to produce electricity. Third issue, we have a, a, a growing problem of uh, interdependencies management between neighbors. Uh, here, this is a, a screen capture this morning of the exchange between France and his neighbors in, uh, in electricity, and that data are provided by the French TSO, uh, RTE, RTE. And, and you see, for example, the, the evolution, it is in a range of the export to import with, uh, with Germany and, and also with uh, Spain. And, and it means that it changed all the time, which is quite uh, classical. But the management of that uh, uh, trade uh, system will be more and more complex uh, as uh, Germany will continue in his uh, own energy transition, the so-called energy vendor, to develop wind power. And uh, the capacities in terms of wind power in uh, Spain are also uh, very impressive. If we want to decrease the level of nuclear power in France, we will also mechanically develop wind power and especially offshore and meaning that we will have to manage all that uh, system. And, and to be frank, today it is, a, uh, how can we say that in English, uh, a mess? Yeah. <laughs> OK. And, and to solve that problem, we, we need to develop interconnection between that countries. And it is very, very complex uh, because uh, it is costly. Uh, but moreover, because the level of uh, acceptance of uh, uh, public is very limited to that new uh, infrastructure. Third, fourth uh, um, issue, uh, to do that uh, in the, at the very center of the, the European strategy, there was the aim to define a price for carbon, not mainly in using uh, taxes, but with the development of a quite innovative cap and trade uh, market. Uh, and this is the, the kind of price which is uh, delivered. Uh, and that price today is very low for many reasons, and especially due to the economic crisis. And it means that it is not possible for uh, investors that want to determine uh, the return on investment of uh, uh, gas power plant, for example, on three, four, five decades to use that kind of price signal uh, to, and to take it into account in the, in the business plan. Fifth issue, and this is not the simplest one, uh, you have here a map of uh, shale gases and also, uh, yes, two minutes, uh, shale gases in, uh, in Europe. Uh, and uh, as you know, they are very um, heterogeneous uh, perspective in Europe, uh, UK, Poland, Denmark, Sweden have said, yes, why not? We will explore it. Uh, while uh, France, Bulgaria, Roma Romania have decided up to now to say uh, no. And, and when we see uh, the consequences of shale gas uh, development in, in US, it means that mechanically, probably, we will have to readdress that issue in the future, and especially in France. <coughs> But since gas is here, maybe that uh, uh, it will still be possible to use it in the next decade. Sixth and last uh, issue, we will have to cope with mechanically with higher electricity prices in Europe. These are the forecasts made by the International Energy Agency uh, last month in their World Energy Outlook. And what we see, it's a bit complex, uh, but uh, just keep in mind that the forecast is the decrease of electric, electricity price in the next decade in, uh, in US, uh, and mainly based on the development of shale gases, while we will uh, mechanically observe an increase in Europe 
and in, in Japan due to the management of the energy transition uh, with an impact on household and we, we already have a, a very significant uh, problem of fuel poverty in Europe and also mechanically impacting the competitiveness of the electricity intensive uh, cooperation. As to conclude, two slides, nevertheless, and despite of that issue, we have to, we have to uh, continue to move in the direction of that energy transition in, in Europe, at least for two reasons. Because the return of, on investment of, of all that uh, uh, investment that we will have to, to make might be impressive. Once again, it is based on the last World Energy Outlook of the International Energy Agency. Uh, published la last month, and, and we see that uh, this is a difference between the energy uh, expenses in uh, Europe in 2035 uh, compared to 2010, with and without the development of uh, energy efficiency measure that will be uh, uh, precise after me by uh, Francois Moisan. And you see, we see that the difference might be a reduction of uh, the energy expenses by 500 uh, uh, USD billion a year. So it might be very profitable from an economic point of view, but also it is much more uh, very and, and maybe moreover important from a geopolitical point of view. What we understand now in Europe is that, and it was anticipated that we will have a growing uh, uh, dependencies uh, towards or import of uh, uh, gas and, and oil. But on the other side, we see, and it is quite surprising for many Europeans, that United States is exactly going in the other uh, direction. And we understand that we have no guarantee that you will keep, for example, your, your vessel in the Strait of Hormuz or in very dangerous places. And then for small countries as Europe, we, we need also to move in the direction of energy transition between, between, because it will be key in the future for uh, the geopolicy and the security of Europe. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. <clears throat> I would like at first uh, to thank um, a lot uh, Michael and uh, his team because uh, I, I, uh, I was not the, s the simplest case. In <laughs> I give you a lot of work. Um, so I, uh, I would like to, to focus my talk about innovation. It's another aspect yeah. of the energy policy. Before, it's not, it's, it's okay? <clears throat> Sorry. Before, just a word about CEA, because uh, you saw this morning my colleagues, uh, Franck Carré is belonging also to CEA, mm -hmm. and uh, maybe you noticed that uh, last year, uh, CEA changed his na its name. Before, it was Atomic Energy Commission, and now it's Atomic and Alternative Energy Commission. The reason, why, the reason is because we developed a lot since mainly 10 years, the research on development on uh, new energy, new technology for energy and renewables. And in fact, we change also the logo in the same time. And uh, as, um, as CA wants to become green, the logo turns in red. It's very logical. <laughs> um, but now we are used to this red color. At the beginning, it was a little shocking. Um, so now on innovation. Um, in fact, first of all, I would like to, to give you a, a global view on innovation policy in France because, of course, it will apply to, to energy policy. France, when we have a, a, a problem, the first thing we, we try to do is to establish a commission and to make a lot of reports. And after 10 years, uh, we try to, to take measures. So this weakness or weaknesses uh, of France in innovation policy was very well known since 15 years. Um, because it's a colon in red, we, we had a 
rather a lack of culture for innovation, especially in university. And uh, there, there was no link as other in other countries between basic research, upright research, and industry. And um, other things, uh, the, the level of research, of public research is good compared to other countries, but the level of, of upright research in industry is rather, is rather low, lowest than the other country. And uh, another thing is what the, that uh, uh, we have not enough SMEs, sm small and uh, medium enterprise, and uh, especially they are not growing uh, fast. And it's the reason why we have a big lack of intermediate companies in France. And after that, uh, in terms of funding innovation, uh, a step was missing, different step was missing, but mainly the, the first step to, to create a startup like a seed capital. But now, but now, since I will say since seven, eight years, we take a lot of measures. It's, uh, it's listed in the, in the blue column. And uh, independently from the type of government, from left or right. And um, finally, um, we, 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 we try to, 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 to overcome these uh, uh, issues with a lot of things, with a lot of money this last year about uh, to, about uh, to create a research, applied research institute, to, um, to give money to campus, to, inst to big uh, university, to, to, to stress out uh, on technological research with a lot. We create uh, seven, eight years ago, um, seven, 71 cluster, like you can uh, find here. And especially, uh, I underlined a very efficient measure, which he, the name is uh, uh, research tax credit. It allows the companies to, to have a tax credit when they launch new research program. And uh, that means that, uh, uh, for example, if they, um, if they give the research program to public uh, laboratory, it's quite free for the company, not exactly free with certain limits, but uh, uh, all the people think that it was of the most efficient measure in the world to, to to, um, to enhance uh, the, the research, applied research in, um, in the companies. And this year, with the new government, we, we have new measures um, to, to continue to develop a research, a applied research in uh, different, uh, different cities in France. And my institute is involved in this, uh, in this uh, program. We create a new bank for the small companies. And uh, I saw this morning in the newspaper that a new measure from the Minister of Innovation and Minister of Research will be taken as to, to, to reserve 2% of the public procurement for innovative SMEs. It's, it was uh, written in Les Echo this morning. And um, to launch um, a new national at national level uh, innovation challenge for breakthrough technology. So I think the situation is, uh, is better than uh, seven years. But now the question is, is this is this landscape too much complex? <laughs> because you see, there is a lot of institute, a lot of uh, measure, cluster, and the, the, the challenge is to, to make all this, uh, this landscape efficient. So now, now I come to energy. And as it was said this morning, on the, this afternoon, I put on this map, not a map of energy, but a map of density of population. And it's very interesting in terms of energy because for transportation, for electric vehicle, uh, it has to be to, to, to taken into account for the, for the, de for the deployment. <clears throat> in fact, uh, France is a relatively uh, concentrated country because you can see that on 8% of the, of the area, we, you will find 60, 65% of the population in red or in, uh, in the blue, and mainly, if uh, I simplify very, uh, a lot, in Paris, North, and Lyon, and uh, Ron, uh, Lyon and Marseille, mainly. Um, that means that we have a lot of uh, uh, place to, for example, for biomass. It's the reason why, in fact, in terms of potential, we have a lot of uh, different uh, renewable sources. Only two minutes, three minutes, okay. And, um, and uh, we have a lot of uh, different characteristics, but also in terms of um, also, uh, cultural specificity, 
we have uh, a lot of uh, things coming from the history, like uh, a tradition of centralization, a principle of geog geographical equity means that uh, every citizen in the, in the country has to pay the same, the same uh, price for electricity, even the he is uh, he's in, the, in the desert. So I have to choose my transparency. So in terms of innovation, I, I make this slide to show you that most of innovation on energy is uh, from mainly from big companies. We, we, we saw just before the example of Alstom. Normally it's uh, on the slide, but you, you can see all the, the big companies uh, listed here and uh, with their uh, topics. Total, for example, on solar, on biofuel, and so on and so on. We have also some startup. Now we hope to have more and more startup. But uh, we have a, a, an issue on solar, or startup uh, working on solar energy because with, um, uh, with some different measures, uh, there, there was a, a stop in the creation of startup. And uh, I wanted to, to, to show you an example on electric mobility because you know that France uh, wants to promote electric vehicle. And, okay, I have no time to detail this, uh, this measure, but we, we take a lot of measures to, to, to promote, so incentive, for example, French government gives up to 7,000 euros if you buy an vehic electric vehicle, and so on and so on, a lot of uh, public procurement. And uh, just an, as an example of innov innovation in the field of electric mobility, I will take the example of Autolib. So Autolib is uh, on Paris, and Paris has different area. Uh, you, you see the city of Paris is a small circle with two million inhabitants, but if you take the, the two first circle, it's about six million, and up to 12 million. And Autolib is a new service of, on mobility uh, on the first and on, on second circle of Paris. Um, it's not, it's a, it's a global service uh, to, to use uh, a mobility when you, when you need. It's, you, you, you have uh, about up to 3,000 cars. Now, it's not yet, but in next year. And with a lot of uh, parking place. And uh, you have just to, you have to rent uh, a, a year uh, for example, you have to pay uh, 100, just to give an example, 144 euros per year. And after, when you want to rent, for example, for half an hour, you pay five euros, and you take the, the car, and you can let, you can let the car uh, in the final place. So it's a quite new service. It's innovative in terms of technologies because uh, the, the, the company behind is Bolloré. Bolloré developed the battery, the car, and uh, I believe it was an investment of one, between one or two billion euros. And the second thing, they developed the service, uh, the infrastructure and the, the service itself. So it's a quite global service. It's an example of uh, what could be very, very innovative in terms of service technology. And I think it's a very, um, it's a very convenient for the very dense cities, the, the heart of the city because there is such problem of place and uh, traffic jam and so on that it's very useful to use um, this type of service. So uh, I don't think it's exactly uh, transposable in the uh, in US, I don't know, but uh, uh, it's an example of innovation, for example. And you can, you can use it if you come to Paris, you can, you can try. And uh, so is my last slide, for conclusion, I put some, um, some topics I saw I see as the most promising topics for innovation in France. Uh, for the short term, of course, smart grid, sustainable mobility, and efficient green building. And I put on the, on the, on the right uh, some examples of French uh, startup who receive uh, best price of uh, innovative uh, uh, companies. And, uh, <clears throat> and after, the, the, as a very, very promising uh, technologies, uh, I saw the energy storage, because energy storage is a big issue for the, for the future. And um, maybe to not only smart grid, but uh, what we call smart energy grid. I have no time to develop, but uh, it's a smart grid uh, um, bridging between electricity and gas. I think it's a very promising topic. Biofuel, marine energy, of course, recycling. 
And of course, uh, we need also to have some breakthrough in the future, and uh, of course, nanotech and biotech, coupling nanotech and biotech and so on, will be very, very interesting. So thank you very much for your attention. Good afternoon, and uh, thank you for the organizer to invite me to speak at, at the, this uh, seminar exchange between uh, US and France on uh, energy policy. Um, just to present myself, uh, I am from an agency, a public agency, depending of Ministry of uh, Energy, Industry, Environment, and Research, and we are in charge of implementing the public policy in the field of energy efficiency, of renewable, uh, but also smart, smart grids and waste uh, and others. Uh, so, first to recall that uh, in, in terms of energy efficiency and renewable, in France, as all the 27 EU member states, uh, we have a directive, which is like a European law, that fixes some objectives for 2020. Uh, first, to increase energy efficiency by 20%. Second, to increase the share of renewable energy in the energy mix by 20%. In fact, for France, it's 23%. And uh, to decrease greenhouse gas emissions by 20% uh, from 1990 level. Just to recall, the Kyoto target for EU was minus 8%. The, the, the two last objectives are mandatory ones. That means that we have to comply with it. It's not just objectives. And a uh, national debate has just been launched, as said Mr. Montand this morning in, uh, in his introduct introductory speech, uh, was launched very recently by the, go the government uh, to be concluded by the end of the first semester. And a law on energy will be voted at the end of 2013. And there is two already uh, priorities. The first one is energy efficiency uh, to be developed. And another announcement uh, that the nuclear share in the electricity mix will be reduced to 50% by 2025. So in this uh, framework, I will present you energy efficiency and renewable policies. Uh, first, the policies measures that are implemented, not all the policies, but maybe best practices, uh, the, the, the policies for renewable dissemination, and also uh, the policy implemented for new green energy technologies development. Paul Lucas presented the, the framework in France. ADEM, as agencies, in charge of a fund to support French companies and uh, research labs to develop new technologies for, for the future, for energy. Uh, we have a budget, you see, for renewable energy of above 1 billion euros on smart grids, on smart grids, important also, and on vehicles, mainly cars, but on only. And I think the important things with this fund, it is there is a part of subsidies, but less than one third. And the most important part is with reimbursable aids. That means that we negotiate with companies for the state to get the money back when the product will be commercialized. And we could, or we could also act through venture capital, taking some part of capital of some companies. So first sector, I will not speak of industry. In industry, the main measure is the ETS, em Emission Trading Scheme, that uh, Mr. Geoffron uh, spoke a, a little uh, before. Uh, and it's through ETS that we have a regulation industry. But on building sector, it's the first priority for energy efficiency. It's the most important sector in France, both housing but also commercial. There is already a target of reducing by 40% energy demand in building sector by, by 2020. And uh, as the rate of construction is very low, the most important is to act on the existing building, which is difficult. So among the measures we have, uh, has been the, the, some 
label has been developed in um, oh, it doesn't seem to work. Uh, we had labels you see on the right uh, that exist on uh, uh, washing machine and uh, refrigerators, but now we have it on all housing. Uh, on the left part is the energy efficiency, so the R uh, dwellings are the most efficient one, the F the most the less efficient one, and on the right part is the CO2 efficiency of the building. So we have this, this label, uh, this, we have also building codes, and every five years there is a, a new building code with a more high performance for the new building, and in 2020 it will be zero, emission, zero uh, net energy buildings. Uh, now regarding the existing stock of buildings, we have put several measures in order to incent, incent uh, the, the owners to make a refurbishment of their dwellings. There is a tax credit on equipment. There is zero interest rate uh, also for refurbishing houses. And uh, these are some part of the, of the measures, but the, we have a new measures for about three years, which is energy efficiency obligations for energy suppliers, which going to a white certificates market. This measure has been implemented in UK, in Italy, in France, and in other countries now. And the idea is that you set to the energy suppliers of electricity, gas, uh, some, ob or some objectives to make energy efficiency at their consumer level. So they have to, to, to make these, for example, through lamps, through e efficient appliance, but also for insulation works, and they get certificates, and they have to deliver the certificates to the government. We had two first period of three years, and it works very well, and each time we increase the level of obligations on the suppliers, and uh, this, uh, this measure is uh, one of the most important in terms of energy efficiency delivery right now. We have also research and development demonstrators and experience on building and smart grids, and I will come back on this, and training of qualification. Oof, I will go fast then. So I will not go through the white certificates, sorry. Just to show, for example, on smart grid, this in the term of industrial experimentation, we already fund 14 projects in order to experiment what could be, what will be uh, the smart grid of tomorrow, and for example, uh, we have in Lyon green lease projects uh, with more than 1,000 households and uh, tertiary companies with uh, the, the electricity distributor involved for uh, energy demand reduction, for example, and in other part with other companies for experimentation. On transport sectors, which is another very important sector because of CO2 emission and oil uh, dependency, some of the measures that has implemented, uh, there is an European agreement of car manufacturers in order to decrease the emissions of new cars with an objective of 120 grams of CO2 per kilometer. We have a car labeling, and you see that we have the same kind of label on cars, and uh, specific measures that has been implemented in France is a bonus malus on new cars, that means, I will go on the next one, uh, the bonus malus is, for example, for the most efficient car, you have a bonus, it's like a subsidy, and for the less efficient car, you have to pay a tax. And the global system should be equilibrated, so there is no cost for the public budget. And as you see, the, the malus could go above uh, several thousand euros, uh, in 2013, for example, for very consuming car, and for electric car, there is a subsidy quite important. The result is shown on this graphic because the system, the system has been set up in 2007 in France, and you may see for the new cars the dramatic drop in emissions per kilometer of the new fleet. So there is a very rapid uh, response of the market to this instrument, which is an economic instrument. In the field of transport and vehicles, with the fund I evoked, we had several contracts with car manufacturers and other companies, and we already spent uh, almost 400 million euros 
in technological innovations, in infrastructure for electrical vehicles. All this is before market deployment is innovations, uh, uh, specific vehicles for urban use. And as uh, Paul Lucas said, we fund some projects for advanced mobility where we could experience what could be uh, the services for mobility in cities. Last word on renewable energy. We have to get these objectives of 23% in the French electricity mix. We have for that on electricity feed-in tariffs, what are, which are paid by the consumer of electricity on PV, on wind, on heat, there is no feed-in tariffs because there is no other mechanisms. So in fact, it's a fund managed by ADEM in order to subsidize, uh, for example, large boilers with biomass. And in terms of biofuels, there is a defiscalization of, uh, but also an obligation for oil producers to incorporate biofuels. But there is also uh, an European directive on biofuels, making eligible only biofuel that has a positive life cycle analysis on greenhouse gas emissions that will prevent, I will say, bad biofuels or biofuels which will not have a net uh, impact globally on greenhouse gas. On renewable, we have also several projects and we work with many large companies like Alstom, for example. Uh, on many projects on uh, renewable, marine energy, uh, solar concentrated, PV. It's short, so I, I will close with the last one, which is the scenarios that we just have produced uh, la last month for the debate on the energy transition in France. We assess what could be with the measure to be developed, with the technology that we will have for 2030, uh, for 2050, what could be the demand in France is the left part. So we think we could decrease by 20% the global energy demand in France in 2030. And in 2050, it's a normative uh, exercise to say if we have to make the factor four scenarios for greenhouse gases, then we could have a decrease most important. And you may see that the between now and 2030, it should be through dwellings and buildings that we, we could have the most gain, but after it will be through transportation and through mobility services that we will gain the most in the different sectors. And on the right, you see what our scenario gives in terms of electricity mixed, the share of different energy with no more fossil energy and the objectives of nuclear at about half of the electricity production a share of renewable intermittent, but a share also of uh, renewable producing basic uh, electricity. Thank you. I, um, <clears throat> I hope that uh, Dr. Newell is feeling better with the uh, uh, flu he came down with. Um, uh, I do not have a PowerPoint as Michael contacted me yesterday and asked me to uh, <clears throat> give some thoughts and uh, that's not a problem. I'm sure one of the reasons Michael contacted me is because he knows I've never had trouble making stuff up at the last minute. <laughs> so <clears throat> I would like to give uh, uh, some thoughts uh, in, in two areas really on energy uh, policy. Uh, the first has to do with, uh, and, and I've really enjoyed the high-level analysis of U.S. and French energy policy, um, and I, I've studied it, it somewhat, uh, but my real background expertise is at a different level of policy making at the state and local level, uh, which I've been engaged with for a few decades now, and particularly in the U.S., I don't know how it is in France, but in particularly in the U.S., uh, in the area of energy and renewables and, and smart grid and all, we've seen the most advance at the state and local policy levels, uh, in, in my opinion. I mean, we've never been able to agree on a national renewable portfolio standard, uh, yet the majority of states, over 30 states now, have established their own renewable portfolio standard, and the growth of renewable energy in this country is really being driven 
by the state renewable portfolio standards and policies and the local policies. In Austin, uh, which uh, I was involved with uh, for, for many years, um, we have gone from zero to 30 percent of our energy now coming from renewable energy. And it's all been driven by the local climate change policy adapted by the city of Austin. We had the first green building program in all of North America uh, established by city policy. Uh, uh, we uh, were leaders in electric vehicles because of uh, city policy. And um, uh, same thing in energy efficiency and in several other areas. And I've seen it in other cities, uh, Portland, Seattle, Los Angeles. Several other cities have taken the initiative. And in fact, if you look at what's actually happening worldwide, um, in, uh, there, are, there are certainly some national strong leadership, as we've seen here, uh, uh, particularly from France in, uh, in climate policy. But a lot of the major advances in, in, in real stuff on the ground is coming from the cities. You look at the International Council for Local Environmental Initiatives. Uh, you look at the, global, uh, the uh, Clinton Global Initiative. Um, uh, which is one of the leaders in, in actual climate change implementation, I think, that's focusing on the 40 largest cities in the world. Uh, and when you view the fact that um, in a few decades, something like 80% of the world's population will be living in urban environments, uh, the actual policies and implementation of those policies at the urban level, I think is going to be the critical place where uh, uh, decision making takes place. So that's one of the thoughts I had uh, when, when Michael asked me to speak. And the second is, I think that one of the major policy issues we're going to face is that we're not prepared for success in our renewable energy and distributed generation and smart grid policies. Uh, our policies to date have focused on incentivizing renewable energy setting standards, requirements for more renewable energy coming into the mix, more energy efficiency coming into the mix through building codes and so forth. And now there's the smart grid uh, coming into place and demand response and so forth. Um, and we've been involved in that very much uh, here in Austin as, as leaders in that area. But I've been on the forefront as a general manager of an electric utility, as a city council member in Austin and such. Uh, and what I see and I'm seeing increasingly around the United States and in, uh, recently in Latin America where I've, I've visited with their countries on integration of renewables is that we're not prepared for the success of these policies in many ways. It is turning out that the integration of renewable energy into the electric grid is more complicated than we first thought. And when you start adding electric vehicles and solar distributed generation and energy storage and uh, smart grid and smart appliances and so forth on the same circuits and levels, the complexity increases exponentially. And, and I'm experiencing a lot of that. And just uh, as an example of uh, three policies that come to mind quickly that I'm running into everywhere, just on the issue of solar distributed generation, the net metering policy, that uh, we use to encourage solar in the first place is now becoming successful and it's turning out that it's a business model that does not support the operation and maintenance of the distribution grid, the poles and wires economically in the system. And now we're seeing fights emerge between the utilities and the renewables community in Colorado and California. And I'm going to Washington next month to meet with the National Edison Electric Institute because it's become a national problem for utilities on how to transition this net metering policy that we've had in place at the state and local level to deal with this. Um, the islanding uh, policies that have emerged on uh, solar. We saw Sandy move in the northeastern United States, wipe out a lot of transmission and distribution grids. We saw the uh, hospitals and so forth kick in their uh, diesel generators and do just fine. And we saw a lot of homes with solar up in the northeast perfectly fine that couldn't use it because of the policies on islanding in the grid that we haven't solved yet. Um, VAR control policies that do not allow solar to provide VAR support to buildings now, uh, and, and so forth. And it's in each of these areas. Smart grid, demand response, and so forth. I constantly run into 
existing policies that promoted the establishment of these new technologies in the beginning and now are major obstacles to the integration of this. And um, uh, to end with uh, uh, some of my uh, war stories, if you will, uh, on the smart grid in particular, um, we were the first utility in the United States to put 100% of our meters to our customers, to smart meters. Um, we established a hospital out here uh, at the, uh, in a smart grid complex that was the first platinum rated lead hospital in the United States. And we had a huge combined heat and power facility. We had the most advanced smart grid interconnections anywhere in the country at that time. And when the DOE came out and cut the ribbon on it, there was big talk about how it was going to be a beacon of light when everything else went out. It was a perfect microgrid that we were establishing. During the first six months of operation of that hospital, it had the worst reliability record of any hospital in Austin. We were constantly having problems with the computers and such, um, and, and things not working correctly. And then one day, I was pulled out of a, a meeting uh, I wasn't in a meeting. I was in a, it was a Saturday. I was in a movie, actually, with my wife. And, and, you know, everything starts going off, my pager and my phone, and all the managers on site, and he, he's, he's going crazy. He said, we're dark at the hospital. This is a uh, children's operating hospital. I mean, and I said, don't, don't worry about it. Let the, we've done this before. The emergency generator will take care of it, and we'll figure out the blame computer problems later. He said, no, you don't understand. We're completely dark. When we manually start the emergency generator, the smart grid system shuts it off. We were pulling wires out of the wall for 10 minutes till we finally able to get that emergency generator set up. And the next day, I wiped out a rose bed and pulled in a big diesel generator to the hospital to completely bypass our smart grid system. And it was computers in the mix. And I've seen it. I've seen it in several locations. Um, you know, we talk in the analogy of we're moving uh, to a wireless technology now, like moving from the old landlines to cell phones. Well, I remind people that we coined the term "dropped calls" when we all got cell phones, <laughs> and the complexities that are emerging in the implementation and integration of renewables and smart grids. We're seeing that the technology moves faster than our policies do. And we've had successful policies to bring this online, and we have a whole new emergency policy issue with making it work right. Thank you. Thank you so much for the comments. We are running short on time, but I'll still take the opportunity to ask a couple of questions. Let me start with uh, Pira. Uh, Coal is very important. Even if we are displacing coal with gas here in the U.S., as we heard from Scott and some other panelists, that uh, coal will be used in other parts of the world, increasingly, especially China uh, and India. And you also mentioned, Pure, that CCS policy is all but stalled in the U.S. Can you give us a little background of what has happened recently in the U.S. on CCS and contrast that with what's happening in the European Union? Well, <clears throat> there's been a, a lot of projects in CCS, and, and certainly a, a number of them here in the U.S. Um, today, to my knowledge, there's just about one that, that's going ahead still. Uh, I'd say the main reason is there's no regulatory base to support CCS, uh, along with no pricing on CO2. So when our customers go to the regulators, uh, the regulators say, why are you doing this? Uh, and, and there's no reason why we should allow you to put that in the rate base. Obviously, um, you know, uh, it's hard for a shareholder to assume these costs is if effectively there's no regulation or incentive to do so. So uh, that's the situation we have today because in terms of the technology where we stand, we know the technologies work. Now we have to bring it to a commercial level, and, and bringing that to the commercial level is extremely expensive. Uh, and, and then you can uh, improve it as you get more uh, familiar with, uh, with what needs to be done, then you can give out the warranties and the guarantees that you need to do in any commercial project. Uh, so that's where we stand today. 
And let me ask the second question to Paul, and other panelists, please uh, uh, feel free to uh, add your own responses. Paul, you, you really very uh, summarized the innovation story, especially as it is evolving in France very well. I was very interested when you mentioned that it's really the big firms in France that have led the innovation story. Now, two questions. One, why have you guys recently felt, uh, felt the need for smaller firms? What is, what is lacking what, for small firms or startups uh, to actually fill the gaps in innovation? What, what was the gap, really? So that's my first uh, question. And then the second question is, uh, you also mentioned the concept of 71 clusters. What are those clusters? How do you define them? What do you provide uh, them with? <clears throat> about the second question first, about the cluster. Um, it's, it's difficult to, to have a, 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 a reliable feedback now, because it's maybe six, six seven years we, we create the cluster. And mainly the cluster are, are very uh, useful to, to build projects between the different stakeholders in a region. Um, there is different topics for the cluster. We have a cluster on, um, on bioeconomy in, uh, in the northeast of France. We have, we have four clusters on energy in France in different locations. And uh, what we call cluster is a regional association between research, education, uh, local authority, and industry. And finally, the, the feedback we have is it's a good, it's a good tool to, to, to enhance the, the communication and to build project. But for example, as, uh, as far as I remember, um, in terms of um, creating startup, for example, there is not a big result. There is not, and uh, for the first question, um, the gap, uh, in fact, you know, uh, when you are in a country, you compare why you don't create job enough, uh, where are exactly the, uh, which type of company could create jobs, and uh, the, the answer, but because in France we compare a lot with Germany, it's uh, our reference, and uh, the difference we find with Germany is uh, this type of intermediate companies, but okay, but uh, intermediate companies between two, 250 people on, on the 5,000 people, they don't create immediately. We have to create at first with one people, two, three, and so So we have the question after how to, to promote a startup or spin-off from research and so on. And we find that there was, if we compare, or US, US, USA is a, very, of course, is a very good example. Uh, we, have, um, we have a lack of startup. And um, so we decide to, um, to try to, 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 to take some measure, but we know that it will take time because we have, um, uh, we have some uh, cultural obstacles to overcome. So it will take time. And all the measures I, I indicate uh, on my slide, I think it will take five, 10 years to, to have some uh, positive results. I don't know if I, I answer the question. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. Yes, sorry. yes, maybe th thank you to respond on, on the same question. I, I think, well, I do think, of course, for small companies, it's difficult to fund innovation alone. But in fact, when you're in uh, energy technologies, in, in technologies, uh, breakthrough technologies, it's, it's also true for bigger companies, for a bigger company. And so, uh, as uh, we said, Paul and, and myself, uh, in France, we decide to have stronger support to innovation for companies. Uh, in, the, in this field, and uh, you may see that uh, uh, in, in order to invest, you need, and I think in all countries, in the US, there, there is also support for innovation. So we had a quite large uh, fund for that. The uh, projects, in average, are from several million euros to several tenths of million euros, it's the uh, amount. It's true also that in the field of energy, there is many large companies, and so we work with large, and in the same consortium, we have large and smaller companies, usually. And the thing I, I just said, but I think it's new, at least in France, is that the most part is not subsidies. It's, uh, we are negotiating with the companies, okay, you will conduct these projects. Us, as a state representative, we will put some money, and you will reimburse regarding the, 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 the revenue you will have on these technologies. So we discuss that, it's in the contracts, and when there will be the market, we will be reimbursed 
on the money and even more than we, what we put and it's like a co-investment with, with the companies. Uh, just you said about CSC, we supported several uh, CSC demonstrator projects, but as Pierre Gauthier said, we could not go right now at the commercial stage since the cost of uh, the price of, uh, of CO2 is uh, about five euros, so it's, there is no place for that. We, we had a very nice, we have uh, very nice projects which may be the only one which could be competitive without CO2 price, which was in the steel industry with ArcelorMittal uh, in France, uh, because it's uh, the blast furnace and recycled glass, gas, you may capture CO2, and there is a more efficient process consuming less coal, and this could be efficient. The problem is that the projects in France is a discussion, let's say. Thank you. Let's, we have time for a few questions from the audience. Yes, sir. Let me repeat the question for the video. The question is about increasing percentage of renewables, but also increasing use of DC uh, appliances or uh, gadgets on the demand side. So any innovative products on the AC-DC conversion? Uh, yes, we, we do have, uh, we have with some uh, Buig, for example, uh, building uh, manufacturers in uh, smart buildings, for example. And we have a very interesting smart building demonstrators it's called Smart ZAE. ZAE means in France zone d'activité économique. So it's a small industrial zone uh, in the, beside a city where there is uh, industry consuming electricity, but also wind and PV production. And the idea is to add the best valorization of renewable energy on the site. It's not isolated from the grid. There is connection for the grid, but the idea is to add the best valorization. So there is. Uh, DC grid among the zone in order to not have the conversion of current with uh, AC. And there is storage with uh, batteries, but also with a, I don't remember the English name, a rotating wheel. Flywheel. Flywheels, thank you. Uh, and so that's experimentation. It's not, of course, yet competitive, but it's in order to prepare the technologies of tomorrow and the behavior of tomorrow. Questions? Dave? So, for the drivers of automobiles, how many have their own garage to plug in? Uh, or how many have to plug up streets? Oh. How much does that right. plug <laughs> how, many, how many drivers in France have garage to park their cars or versus how many park it on, on the street? Um, I, I work a little uh, in the last month on these topics, and uh, it depends if you are living in Paris or living in other, so it's very different. Um, if I remember correctly, for example, in Paris, and the situation is different if you are living in the first circle I mentioned, or if you are living in the suburbs. In Paris, less, in Paris is very spe special, because in Paris, Paris, you, less than 50 people, 50 families, Half car. Person. Persons. Person. Person? Okay, yes. no yes. family. Person. Yes. Half cars. So that, that means that uh, most of the people uh, do, uh, don't have any car. So, first thing, and for the, um, the remaining people who have car, uh, I believe that uh, about 20, 25 uh, percent are in the street, and uh, there is more car in the, in the parking, public or private, uh, than in the street. So I don't remember exactly the figure, but I can send you uh, the, exactly. And it's very, it's very important for the deployment of electric, of course, for electric uh, infrastructure. Very, very important. We have time for one more question. Last question. Michael. Mm -hmm. 
Ooh. I'll let my friend start off. <laughs> but yeah, let, let me re repeat that. One, one thing that France does very well that the U.S. should do, and one thing that the U.S. does very well on energy that France should do. Uh, I, I can start. Uh, uh, the one thing that, good Fran that France does that is, is good on energy policy was mentioned this morning or, or a little earlier on is, is that once they decide on something, they stick with it. So for industry, that is extremely important. Uh, certainty is, is, attracts investment. Uncertainty makes it disappear uh, without a doubt. Roger. Chance to my to Roger. Roger, and then I'll come for that. Well, uh, it's somewhat the same answer uh, in in the sense that I think that the nuclear standardization in France is certainly something that the U.S. could emulate uh, in in our nuclear policy industry. I'm I'm not sure I know enough about France's policy to say what the United States is doing that they should uh, they should emulate from us, except that. I think the local policies in the United States have been very progressive in certain areas, and uh, if that is not the case in France, that's something you could look at. Prose, final comment, and then break. Uh, uh, yes, I, I think uh, there is something we we, sh we should get from uh, from U.S. and so something I I understood. Uh, last year when I come in US in, in California and I saw a big movement which called collaborative consumption, which is emerging in US where instead of belonging all the equipment, you share it like uh, Paul presented for uh, uh, the cars, for example, and there is a dramatic decrease of consumption through this sharing of, of equipment. There is less, so uh, less foot, footprint. So I think in France we should adopt this uh, movement in US, even if it's not in all US. Yeah. <clears throat> I, I think that we, we should pay attention to the evolution of uh, uh, fracking in, uh, in US, because in the debate that we have in uh, Europe and especially in France, we, we, we think up to now that we have to choose on one side to make the energy transition or on the other side to, to use uh, shell gas. And, and maybe there is another uh, solution using shell gas for the energy transition, uh, which is not the view today in France, to be clear, but maybe later. Thank you so much. <laughs>